Wonderful. OK, right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our pre-retirement session for May 2024. The last time I ran one of these sessions was in uh, February, I think. So we're trying to do them every three months with different other webinars in between. Um, so I'm just going to run you through a quick agenda as to what we are going to cover today. Um, so it's fast. OK, we're going to go fast and I'll never finish at eight o'clock just so you're all aware of this. It's very aspirational. We're going to look at uh, four questions, OK, as part of your retirement planning. It's probably important to say as well, you're all going to be somewhere different on this journey and that's OK. So some of you, this might be the start of it. Some of you might be quite far into it. Some of you might think you already know what you want to do. You just wanted to attend for some clarity. Some of you might just be attending because it's fun. I don't know. What we're going to look at is how much do I need? What will I get from the state? What will I get from your NHS pension? And then when should you retire? So these are all things that we have to work through in order to know what we should do and when we should do it. OK. And it's going to be different for every single person. So nobody has the same set of circumstances as somebody else. So what you must not do is do what Bob did because you are not Bob. If that makes sense, you need to make sure that you engage with this and understand it for yourself. Um, I also want to talk to you about as well about roles and responsibilities. So we've introduced uh, myself. That's not on the recording. I did it beforehand. But as I mentioned, my name is Laura and I am the person behind the Facebook group and Pengage uh, Limited is my company that I started six years ago. Um, we are here to provide as much support for you as you can. But what we also want to do is try and teach you to be able to self-service. So what that means is to be able to use the information that is available to you. Um, and part of the role there that we need to be aware of is actually the other people that are involved in our pension position and our pension savings. <coughs> Excuse me. Every single session, there's a sneeze. So I want to talk to you about roles and responsibilities first in the scheme so that we can make sure we really understand this. And this is really important. So if you learn anything today, let it be this before you switch off. OK. Your employer has a massive responsibility when it comes to your pension, so they will make sure that they are deducting the right pension contributions from your pay slips. You need to check that. You need to use the website that we just looked at to look at what your salary is, to look at what contributions are being deducted and is it correct, because things can and do go wrong. And um, there are a significant number of people that never look at their pay slip. So that is your employer's job. It is also your employer's job to provide data about you once a year to the NHS pensions agency. And they usually do that in around May time for the period from the 1st of April to the 31st of March. So they'll be doing it now for the period from the 1st of April 23 to the 31st of March 24. That information is then processed by NHS pensions and is used to produce your total reward statement on ESR for those of you in England. And for those of you in the other nations, it's used to produce your statements. OK. ESR, for those of you in England, is actually owned by the employer. So if there is anything wrong or there's anything missing, then the first stop has to be the employer. OK, the employer has a big responsibility in this. And when we talk about employer, it can be different people at your employer, depending on what we're talking about. So I'll quite often say to somebody when we're looking at retirement forms, for example, you need to speak to your employer and they'll go, is that my manager? And I'm like, might be. It could be payroll. It could be HR. It could be your pensions team if you have one. It will be different for everybody and it could be different depending on what you want to know. So you need to make sure you look at things like your intranet sites for your retirement policies to find out who your point of contact is. If you're in a GP practice, it might be your practice manager or you might have a certain person who does the payroll run. Oh, Jill, as if by magic. Um, so you might not have access to ESR as well. You're quite right, Jill, if you're in a if you're in a practice, but you can speak to whoever your pensions contact is and request an annual statement. You should be doing that. You should be getting a statement every year. If you can't get access to your total reward statement, I'm going to come on to that later. You can request a statement. Um, so ah, excellent. There we go. That comes up. So therefore, you need to make sure that you are blame NHS pensions for every single thing that goes wrong because quite often it might not be them it might sit somewhere else and we need to understand that in the process 
when you retire, your employer is responsible for completing the forms with you, for sending the forms off to NHS pensions, for closing you down on the payroll system and things like that, and on the pension online system. And if that isn't done properly, NHS pensions can't do what they need to do. So we always need to make sure that we know who is involved in the process and when, and this is why our guides are really important. Obviously, the other big player is the pension scheme. Now, for England, it's the NHS Pensions Agency or BSA, Business Services Authority. In Scotland, it's SPPA and in Northern Ireland, it is HSC. Sorry, um, NHS England is also England and Wales. Sorry about that. So these guys are responsible for doing your calculations and making sure that your record is up to date and for providing you with information. But they only do that with the information that they have from you and your employer. So if any of that is wrong, then it's likely the information that they provide to you will be wrong. So um, they do get things wrong. They do have some delays at the moment. We'll talk about those later, but let's cut them a bit of slack and understand that they are only one part of this process. It does not all sit at their door. OK, and the other thing, thing, person, party who is really important in this process is you. Too many times people don't look at their statements. You need to be looking at these total reward statements or requesting a statement every single year. You need to be checking that the information that the pension scheme has about you is correct. You need to be asking for a breakdown of your service in case any of it is missing. It's quite common. There's been a lot of posts about that this week. People having years missing because back in the days of old, we didn't have super with the electronic transfers of data. It was quite manual and it's not unusual for service to be missing, particularly if you moved around a lot early in your career. Is it all there? How do you know? Have you ever even checked? Have you looked at it? Do you read the supporting notes with your statements or do you just look at the first page and say, I don't understand what it's telling me? They all have supporting notes, you know, and those notes are there to support you with understanding what the statement is. But you have to take responsibility for this. I cannot stress that enough. Now, there's over 300 of you on here tonight, which is excellent, because that is exactly what you are doing by attending today. And if you're on the Facebook group, also excellent because you want to know more. OK, it is not good enough to say my employer got it wrong or I thought it was OK. You have a responsibility to check. Those of you who've been on this before will know what I'm going to say next. Your pension is your first or second biggest asset. And if it is second, it's probably only behind your house. Your pension provides you a salary for when you stop work for as long as you live. So let's say that my pension is £10,000 a year and I live for 30 years. That's £300,000 plus my lump sum. So it's now 330000 plus actually it increases every year in payment, which means it's more like £400,000. My house isn't worth £400,000. This is a huge asset that you have, that we have, and we need to give it the time that it deserves so that you can make the best financial decisions. Now, I know it feels complicated. It is complicated, but what makes it more complicated is when we don't look at it and we don't try and learn and we need to give it time. And the first time you look at it, it's going to be hideous because you've never done it before. But it and it's an iterative process. But it's really important that we all understand our role in this, because if you don't, then that is when things go wrong. You could have service missing, which means your benefits could be underpaid. That's not fair because you're entitled to those benefits. Um, it could mean that things are paid late because something wasn't filled in correctly and all of it ultimately impacts on you. So we want to get ahead of that as much as we can and be looking at all of this stuff as early as we can. OK, lecture over. Uh, let me have a look on the questions and then we're going to look at how much do we need. Um, Jane, just realised I'm showing up as my professional name, but registered for your It doesn't matter, Jane. I'm OK. I'm not, I'm not too concerned. I've got your email address. Um, it seems you can now check your service by your ABS. Not sure about TRS though. Yes, that is right. So your annual benefit statement includes a member statement within that, which is a breakdown of your service. So where you worked, when you worked there, what hours you worked and so on. So we'll always get an annual benefit statement. For those of you like Jill, who have access to my NHS pension, which is a new online system that is gradually being rolled out. So if you haven't got it yet, don't panic. It's coming. It's being rolled out region by region. Um, then you will also find that your service information is included on there. It's quite hard to pick through. It's not presented in the easiest way, but it's there. So you can have a look. 
Um, Susan, how do you recover those lost years? I tried to do this and was told I had to produce pay slips from 1988 and I don't have them. Do not, Susan, do not have pay slips going back to 1988. Uh, no, that's quite common. Uh, what you can do is you can contact HMRC and ask them for your contracting out service history. And if they send that to you and it says you were contracted out, in 1988, for example, that means you will have been a member of the scheme and the NHS pension scheme will usually take that as evidence to reinstate your service. Lots about this on the Facebook groups. So have a search for that. Now you know how to do that. Uh, my ESR last annual benefit statement says updated 30th of 11th, 2016. Amanda, I know what you're doing. And we're going to look at TRS shortly, but that is the 1995 section that you're looking at, isn't it? And that is because that initially on the 1st of December 2016, you moved into the 2015 section. So if you scroll on and you find your 2015 statement, you should say that was that's been updated to March 23. Um, again, we need to understand what our statement is telling us before we start getting alarmed by it. So we need to read all of it to understand it. And I'm going to talk about TRS in a bit. And that also is to do in the cloud. You are welcome. Um, I had had this, my salary on it isn't correct. Who do I contact? Right, Sarah, what did I say? Where does the information come from? Who provides that information? It's the employer. So we start with the employer. But what I will say is that the employer has not yet provided pensionable pay data up to the 31st of March 24. So any estimates that you get will always use the pensionable pay up to the previous March, which at the moment will be March 23. So if it is incorrect, just because it is a bit out of date, that will not change and that won't change until you actually leave or retire um, unless an update is running between times. So if it's just a bit out of date, that it, that's normal. And that's because the pension scheme doesn't have that information from your employer. Uh, Michelle, definitely check pay slips, particularly if changing grade, as my contribution was wrong for three years and I had a large amount to repay when I noticed less than that. Yeah, exactly. We are very good as people have gone, oh, no, I don't check. It's not my responsibility. How is it not your responsibility? This is money coming off your salary. Why are we not checking that we're getting the right amount of salary? If you were due a pay rise, you would want to be checking you've got the pay rise. Why are we not checking our deductions are correct? Why are we not that interested that we're not doing that? Why do we not think we should check our statements? So it is really important because it's only going to bite you later on. OK, let's move on because no, again, lecture, lecture, lecture. Mum voice will disappear now. Right. So we're looking at retirement. OK. It's really important and when we're looking at retirement, we ask ourselves one question before we do anything else. Before we start saying, I'm going to take this bit of my pension, I'm going to take that bit of my pension, what is the process? We need to ask ourselves one question, and that is, how much money do I need? The amount of times I run these sessions and I'll say to people, do you know your number? So knowing your number is knowing how much net income you need for when you stop work. I guess it's not going to be exact, is it? Because it's going to change. And people don't. So I'm like, OK, so how are we, how are we making our financial decisions then? If we don't know how much we need, it would be like me going to my husband and saying, hello, uh, I've got a new job. And then go, oh, that's good. And it's great. That's good. Really good work life balance. Going to really enjoy it. OK, that's great. Um, how much does it pay? I don't know. What? Oh, well, I don't know. You don't know. So what? I'm sorry. Do you see what I mean? We don't do that, do we? Because we all need a certain amount of money. So before we start running to the door, we need to make sure that we've done our due diligence. So how much do we need? And um, one of the things that's important to recognise from my little chart that you can hopefully see here is we don't need or spend the same amount of money right across retirement. It's not flat, is it? So if it was flat, this would go all the way across. And you can see it doesn't do that because what generally happens is we need or want more money earlier because we can do fun stuff like um, get a camper van and travel around Europe or go on 27 cruises or pay off the mortgage or perhaps give some money to the kids to get them on the property ladder, so on. So we always spend more earlier. And then as we get a bit older and we slow down a bit, our need for money isn't quite as great usually. So we start spending less. And then what happens is perhaps as we get older still, we might then need a bit more money again, um, perhaps for some care and support at home. So that's quite important when we look at making our decisions is 
uh, how long do we think we're going to live for? You know, it's a million dollar question. But also, actually, what does that look like? What is the shape of what we want our money to look like against how much money we need? It's really important. So that's got to be your first starting point. Um, I always say to people, you need to walk, do not run through this process. Huge financial decisions, huge financial opportunities. This isn't something you should just go, I'm going to retire in three months. And I've not looked at anything. It's at least 12 months, if not more. I know some of you are on here and you've got three or four years to go. Great time to be here. Five, six years to go. Great time to be here because you've got time to start looking at your service, to start understanding, to do your numbers. Um, and that's really important. It is not something that should be rushed. So the more time you can give this, the better. So walk, don't run. But this is the first step. How much do you need? Because until you know that, you can't make any key decisions really about your pension that's informed. OK, so know your number. OK, if you ever see me write that down, that's what I mean. Right. How much do I get? So. We potentially will have income. Yes, she left. She look and see the lights at the end of the tunnel. She has five years left. Um, you less than me, Sheila, which is great for you. Honest. Um, so we've got potentially we've got sources of income that come from different places that we might not be aware about. So let's have a look at what that means. OK, so um, state pension. OK, now our, we all get a state pension or we should do. And our state pension is totally separate to our NHS pension. They are not in any way linked at all. Um, the amount you get possibly have some ramifications from previous membership but actually what you're when you take your pension how you take your pension they're totally separate things okay now the best thing to do is to get a state pension forecast and you can do that through the .gov gateway so this little back box that you can hopefully see here is a link so if you go on and you can log into your .gov gateway and it will give you your state pension forecast okay so it will show you your state pension age so for most of you it will say um, 67. Uh, for some of you, like me, it might say 68. And that is because the uh, state pension age is based on your date of birth. And um, so the younger you are, the later your state pension is currently set to be. So anybody born after 1979, which I am, means that your state pension age is going to be 68, which is very joyous. Can't wait. Um, it will also show you your entitlement, so how much you should be on track to receive at state pension age. The maximum entitlement currently is £221.20 a week. So if it says that for you, then you are on track for the maximum. Um, if it's a bit less, then it might be that you've got some gaps. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, it increases each year at the moment by something called the triple lock. It's very political, the, tri the triple lock. So it's election time. So obviously nobody's changed it. Uh, they might change it in the future. Um, but the triple lock essentially means that it will increase, increase by the higher of two and a half percent, the increase in earnings or the increase in inflation each year. So in April 23, it went up by 10.1 percent, which was inflation. And in April this year, it went up by 8.4%, I think it was, which was earnings. So it keeps uh, keeps increasing every year. So when the time you get there again, it should have gone up again. Now, the amount of state pension you can have references your national insurance record. Since 2016, the requirement has been that you have to have the equivalent of 35 years at full rate national insurance. For those of you who were building up national insurance before 2016, it might not be 35 years, it might be a bit more, it might be a bit less, it just depends on your circumstances. And that's why it's really important that you check your record so that you can manage uh, your expectations of how much extra income you will get from state pension age. But let's say you get the full amount, that's currently just over £11,000 per year of state pension, okay? So definitely have a look at that because that's really important as well and it forms a big part of your planning. Have we got any questions on the state pension? I just do this so I can drink tea um, in between slots. No, are we all right? Okay. Marvellous. 
Right. The other thing is benefit. OK, so let's talk about the state pension again. Totally lied. Haven't finished it all. The state pension, by the way, is a benefit. Um, it's a benefit and it's been a benefit since 1946 after World War Two, when it was first introduced to help soldiers and families. OK, it is not a new thing that it is a benefit. Some people think it only became a benefit in 2016 when it changed. This is not true. It's always been a social security benefit. It is a contributory benefit because what it means is that how much you get depends on your national insurance record. But it is still a benefit. And the importance of that is that it can and it does change. And we've seen that with the pension ages changing, for example. So just be aware of that. Now, there are other benefits that you can become entitled to when you start receiving your pension as well. Um, there's a again, these are links. There's a calculator called Entitled To. So you can access that and stick in your information and it will tell you what benefits you might be entitled to claim. You can use that now and just to check if there's anything you can have now that you didn't know about. But you can also use that when you reach pension age because very typically your salary, your pension, sorry, is not going to equal your salary. Your income is going to go down almost certainly. So there are things that you might be able to claim. So, for example, carer's allowance, if you have caring responsibilities, uh, PIP, personal independence payment, if you have a medical condition, attendance allowance, warm homes discount, council tax discount and so on. There's lots of things that you might be able to claim. And some of it does also depend on your local area, which is why this calculator is really good. So check that as well. That's really important. Now, Nigel, bless him, has written pensioner perks. Um, what he really means here is things like free bus travel, free train travel, prescription costs, all when you get to state pension age as well. So these are extra things that you can factor in. Not a direct source of income, but it might reduce your costs because you can get to places, um, certainly some places free of charge, which is really important. Um, so just have a look at that as well. That is really important. So we want to look at what our state pension is. We want to look at if we might be entitled to claim something else. The thing to remember, of course, is with all successive governments and budgets and stuff, things do change, but it's quite useful to keep on top of it, to be aware of it as well. Um, hello, Angie. Am I right in thinking childcare responsibilities protect contributions? If you are the person in your house that has claimed child benefit, then you will receive the national insurance credit for that yes but if you haven't claimed the child benefit and somebody else have they receive the credit for that so sometimes what we find is women um, who typically stay at home to look after children might have gaps in their national insurance record if they didn't also claim the child benefit so perhaps the spouse did so you can sometimes get it swapped across if that has been the case but yes if you claim child benefit um then you get it right then yes you do need to contact them because they you haven't got any benefits or any credit that's building against you so give them a ring and see if you can swap them over because sometimes they will let you do that um hello Alison is state pension tax free or same as all other incomes so the state pension um is classed as income from all sources so that means that it is assessed for income tax purposes which I'm going to talk about in a moment so if your income was just the state pension you're 11,000 pounds a year you wouldn't pay any tax on it uh, because it's below the threshold which I'm going to talk about in a second but with, when we've got to add it in with your other income then yes you may end up paying tax on it yeah um, okay so when you look at your pension statements, so whether that's your total reward statement or your estimates, um, annual benefit statements, whether it's from the NHS or any other pension scheme, they are giving you the gross pension figures. OK, so they are the figures before income tax. Pensions in payment, because think of it as pension income. So pension income is assessed for income tax. OK, so we need to be aware of that. And as we've just established from um, Alison's question, it includes the state pension as well. So when you are doing your calculations of your know your number and then trying to determine when you can retire, you need to make sure that you factor in there will be income tax deducted as well. Now, for those of you on the Facebook group, I did a miss. We're on doing myths this week and I've just done number four um, about an hour and a half ago and number four is about income tax. So if you're on the group, now you know how to use search, go on and have a look and so that you can see a bit more information about that as well. 
You might want to consider when you retire in a tax year, not necessarily, don't everybody kind of uh, panic um, about this, but sometimes it can make a difference because when we're looking at tax, we look at your income in the tax year. So um, let's, for example, um, say that my income in the, um, my pension was my only income and my pension was £12,000 a year. So these are the uh, England and Wales rates of tax, OK? So Scotland and Northern Ireland will be a little bit different. You might just need to Google that, all right? And know you can use Google. Um, but what we have is we have, all of them work the same way in that we have thresholds. So we anything uh, typically we can earn um, in England and Wales up to £12,570 and we pay no tax, and that's called our personal allowance. So if my only source of income in the tax year is my pension and it's £12,000 a year, I'll pay no tax on it because it's under that threshold. Does that make sense? Um, and then for anything between 12,571 and 5270, we would pay 20% tax. And then for anything over 5271 up to about 125, we would pay 40% tax. So let's say that I am, one of the questions I get quite a lot is, or statements I receive quite a lot is, I don't want my pension and my salary because I'll pay more tax. And I'm like, oh, here we go. It's the same thing all the time. And I think it's because we just, nobody teaches us about tax and we just don't understand how it works. So let's say that my salary is 50,270. So that means that I've got 12,570 where I pay no tax on it and about 37,000. So between these two numbers that I pay 20% tax on. I'm now going to start receiving my pension from 1995 because I'm 60. And that pension is £10,000 a year. So that gets added on to my salary of 50,000 and it's now 60,000 of income. What that means because it's over 5270, is every bit that is over 5270, I'm going to pay 40% tax on. So my £10,000 a year of pension means I actually receive, in this example, £6,000 a year. OK. That is still £6,000 a year more than I was receiving before I took my pension. Does that make sense? So we need to stop letting the tax tail wag the pension dog because Yes, you might pay, you might be in a higher tax bracket, but it's because you're receiving more income than you were before. And you don't suddenly get taxed on everything at 40 percent in this example. It's just the bit that's over. OK, so we need to make sure that we really understand that. Now, now knowing that you might go into the 40 percent bracket, you might think, oh, actually, I'll work a bit less and earn a little bit less. And that's quite nice. And that balances me out nicely. And that's fine. But I think we just need to not make sure that the tax is not the thing that's driving the decisions. OK, it's really important. It's like if I said to um, Penny, hi, Penny, you've worked so hard. It's brilliant. I'm going to give you an extra £10,000 a year. Well done. I really I don't know, Penny, but I don't think Penny's going to turn around and say, um, no, thanks, because I'm going to pay more income tax on it. We don't do that, do we? We don't do that with pay rises. And that's what we would be doing with the pension. So we need to make sure that we fully understand what the implications of tax are so that we can factor it into our figures, that's really important. But we mustn't go, oh, I don't want it because I'll pay more tax. Because But you've still got more income. What are you doing? Um, and in answer to your question, Penny, you are quite correct. Lump sum is usually tax free. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But just to give you the headline now, so long as your lump sum amounts from your pensions do not exceed £268,275, it's not common, does happen, then there is no tax to pay on the lump sum. So lump sum is tax free, pension is subject to income tax, but there's more considerations in there as well. We need to make sure we understand all of those. OK, any questions on tax? So we've done state pension, we've done benefits, we've done a little bit on tax. We're now going to dive into the NHS pension scheme. OK, and I'm going to go quite fast because we are Quarter to eight, quarter to eight, quarter to seven. Long day, everyone. OK, so let's just do a very quick introduction to other pension schemes. Right. In the UK, we've got two different types of pension scheme. We've got defined benefit or DB and defined contribution or DC. The two types of scheme are very different to each other and therefore should never be compared. 
Defined benefit schemes have a formula that calculate the pension benefits. And so that's why the, the benefit is predetermined or predefined by that formula. The formula usually relates to your earnings. And what it does is it will provide you with an income for life for when you stop work. OK. Defined contribution schemes, very different. What happens is contributions are paid. They go into an investment fund. The value of that fund can go up or down and that risks it very much with the individual. Um, and then when the individual reach retirement, um, they can choose what they do about the fund. So it's quite flexible in how they take the benefits, but the it, it's less valuable than a defined benefit scheme. And you've got all that risk. So, you know, if somebody remembers what happens at the, at the end of 2008, the bottom fell out of the market, the four horsemen of the apocalypse rode in and people who were in defined contribution schemes, it halved overnight because everything just plummeted. So you have to think um, that um, the different types of schemes work in very different ways. So you can't really compare them. OK, now the NHS pension scheme and all of the other public sector pension schemes are defined benefit schemes. So that means that you have a formula that will calculate your pension benefits for you and that will provide you with an income for life for as long as you live. OK, defined contribution schemes now are typically what you would find as a SIP, so a self-invested pension plan, personal pension and most private sector pensions now are these defined contribution schemes. You do not really find defined benefit schemes in the private sector because they are just too expensive for employers to maintain. They just cannot afford it anymore. Um, so it's really difficult. Does anybody know how much your employer pays in to the NHS pension scheme on your behalf? Does anybody want to have a guess? While you're doing that, Claire, yes, you're right. So any pensions in payment, you do not pay national insurance on, just income tax. Oh, look at you lot all swatting up. So you're all in the right, ball, right ballpark. It increased in April and the employer currently pays 23.78% for each of you to be in the scheme in addition to your salary. OK, so it's significant, the contribution that they pay, and that's in what they have to pay in order to provide you with the level of benefits. And that's why you don't see it in the private sector. It's too expensive. They're just sitting there. Now, within defined benefit schemes like the NHS, we get two other types of scheme. So think pension schemes at the top, defined benefit, defined contribution, and then under defined benefit, we've now got final salary and career average. OK. Now, they're both defined benefit schemes because they both use a formula to calculate the pension, but the formula works a little bit differently. So the probably best way to explain it is to show you. So in the NHS pension scheme, we've got three sections at the moment. We've got the 95 section, we've got the 2008 section, and we've got the 2015 section. Now, the section that you initially joined will depend on when you joined the scheme. So if you joined at any point, before the 1st of April 2008, you will have joined in the 1995 section, even if it was before 1995, it's still the 1995 section. The NHS scheme, by the way, has the worst naming conventions I've ever come across, but that's what we've got. If you joined between the 1st of April 2008 and the 31st of March 2015, you will have joined in the 2008 section. And if you joined after the 1st of April 2015, you will have joined in the 2015 section. Now, when the 2015 section was first introduced, uh, some of you were moved across into that scheme automatically. And that has been become subject to something known as the McLeod ruling, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. So put a pin in that. But let's just focus on the benefits first. So. 95 and 2008, as you can see here, are what we call final pay or final salary sections. And that means that the pension is calculated using your service and your current pensionable pay. So even though you might now be in the 2015 section, we still use your current pay to calculate your 95 pension, for example. So if you have a pay increment or you move up a band, it will increase all of your 1995 pension. So you can see we've got the formulas written down for you there, so you can do this yourself. Um, you see we've got fractions, so we've got an 80th and a 60th, pensions love fractions, um, and that's just what we call the accrual rate, and that is the rate at which the pension grows. 
So what we would do is one divided by 80 times by your cur final current pensionable pay times by your pensionable service. Now, your final pensionable pay, as I say, is linked to your current pay and it is your full time equivalent pay. I'm going to say this very slowly because I usually end up answering eight questions that ask me the same thing. Um, we are on slide 24, Amanda. Um, your final pensionable pay is your full time equivalent pay. Full time pay. Full time pay. Um, so therefore, if you um, work one hour or you work 37 and a half hours for the 1995 and 2008 sections, we still use the full time equivalent pay. So reducing your hours now or indeed increasing your hours to try and increase your 95 or 2008 benefits will have no impact at all because it's full time equivalent pay. So one divided by 80 times by pay times by your pensionable service. Now, your pensionable service is the length of time that you have been in this section for. It doesn't include when you moved into 2015, this section, OK, because this is the section we're calculating. That service is reduced for any part time working whilst in this section and also excludes any unpaid leave or absences. OK. So that's sometimes called reckonable service or reckonable membership, but it's pensionable service. So one divided by 80 times by pay times by service. That gives you your annual pension for your 1995 benefits. And the 1995 is the only section that also has a lump sum that is payable in addition to the pension, which is three times whatever the pension is. So if we calculated my pension to be £10,000 a year, the lump sum would be three times that and it would be 30000 just going to pause. Can everybody see the slides? I think Claire might be having some issues. I just want to check is anybody else having any issues? No, we're all all right. OK, Claire, if you're still struggling, you might have to leave and rejoin. Thanks, Alison. You might have to leave and rejoin. It's probably an internet connection thing. Um, in terms of pensionable pay, Claire, yes, high cost supplement is uh, included, sometimes uh, called London waiting or it used to be called London waiting. Not all elements of your pay are pensionable. It's important you understand that. Again, if you look at those scheme guides that I showed you online earlier, that will tell you what is and is not usually pensionable. OK, but London waiting high cost living allowance is OK. Unsociable hours out. Um, and if you're a clinician, any PAs up to 10 is pensionable, but anything over 10 is not and so on. So you just need to be aware of what is pensionable um, and what's not. Um, so that's for the 1995 section. Um, Jill, can I ask, my lump sum does not then match my predicted annual pension. Um, can you explain it? So it's not what you're saying is your lump sum is not three times the pension. Is that on the TR? Is that on an estimate or on a t the on an estimate? OK, there'll be a reason for that. I'll come on to that in a second. Um, on the oh, on the app, um, it should be. So it's not three. Are you in 1995 or 2008? OK, might have to look at that separately, Jill, because that doesn't sound quite right. Uh, it should be three times the, the pension. Um, put a pause on that. We might have to look at it later. 2008 is very similar, but this is 60th. So you can see that we've got a different fraction. Now, just to check we all understand fractions, is the 60th bigger or smaller than 80th? Bigger. Thanks, Andy. Does everybody understand fractions? It's a bit weird. It's, it's, yes, you're all very good, aren't you? Um, for anybody who doesn't, let's imagine we've got a cake, a massive cake, by the way, and we're going to cut it into 80 slices. OK, that would be an 80th. We've got the same cake and we're going to cut it into 60 slices. So because we're only cutting it into 60 slices instead of 80 slices, each slice is going to be bigger where we're only cutting 60. So that's why a 60th is bigger. That's how we kind of explain it. OK, yeah. So we've got one divided by 60 times by pay times by service. And it's the same thing. It's full time pay 
and it's your service reduced for any part-time working or unpaid leave. There is no automatic lump sum in 2008. You can choose to take a lump sum by swapping some pension and that's called commutation. The exception is if you were somebody who opted to move from 1995 to 2008, you will have a lump sum because that relates to your bit when you were in the 95 section. OK, and it's a, it'd be a funny amount. Doesn't really seem to tie up to anything. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 2015 then is still a defined benefit scheme because we still have a pension that's calculated based on a formula um, and it's called a care scheme or a career average revalued earnings scheme or career average for short. Uh, basically, the best way to explain this, I think, is building blocks. So what we do is we take your pensionable pay in a year and we've got another fraction, which is 50 fourths, which is bigger again. So we've got the same cake. And we're going to cut it into 54. It's bigger again, isn't it? It's actually quite a bit bigger than the slice of an 80th. Isn't that interesting? So we're going to take your pay. So let's say your pay is 54,000 and we're going to divide it by 54. That means that I've then got a thousand pounds per annum for my first year of being in the 2015 section. And that would pay to me every single year when I retire. So if that's 25 years, then I'll get a thousand pounds times 25, 25,000 pounds. Um, the next year we do the same thing again. So we take my pensionable pay again for that year. So let's say it's still 54,000 and we divide it by 54. That's a thousand pounds again. And now I add that on to the thousand pounds that I'd already got. So I've now got 2000 pounds a year for when I retire. And the following year we do the same thing again and so on and so on and so on. So it builds each year like building blocks based on our pensionable pay for the time that we're in that section. OK. Now, it also is linked to inflation. So each April, the 2015 section will increase by the increase in the consumer price index plus one and a half percent. So in April 23, it went up by 11.6 percent. In April 24, it went up by 8.2 percent. So it grows very quickly each year, a lot quicker than the other two sections, which is worth remembering. Again, there's no automatic lump sum, but we can swap some pension for lump sum, which is called commutation. OK, questions. Um, please explain the differences between GP practitioners and the hospital colleagues. OK, so this is definitely a session that's more for um, officers. We do run a separate GP session, but essentially 2015 is the same whether you are an officer or a practitioner. The 1995 and 2008 sections of the practitioner, again, work very similar to this. Um, there actually are care schemes as well. They're not final pay schemes. So same sort of principles in that they use your pay over the time that you're in that section for. OK, if you're somebody who's got officer and practitioner, then you'll have some service calculated on one basis and some of it calculated on the other and two are added together. OK. Um, do the previous building blocks grow with CPI as well, Jay? Yes. Yeah, so every year. So let's say in year one, I've built up a thousand pounds. And the inflation is 10% because I'm lazy and that's that's how I work. So that means that my thousand pounds is now eleven hundred pounds. OK, then in year two, I've added another thousand pounds. So I've now got two thousand one hundred pounds and I'm going to add inflation to that as well, um, which let's say is 10% again. So then that means I've now got two thousand three hundred and ten pounds. And then the next year, I'll add another however much on and then I'll add inflation onto the whole amount. And so it just grows and grows and grows like that. It grows really quickly, really, really quickly, much quicker than the other sections in a typical year. Now, the one thing that I need to talk to you about as well very quickly before we move on and do my cloud is what you can see here, which says NPA. Now, I did another myth busting on this um, this week. Now, NPA stands for normal pension age. Normal pension age is the age at which you can access the pension benefits without them being reduced for early payment. Um, it's not the mandatory age. If I had a pound for every time I heard somebody say, I can't take my pension till I'm 57. Can you not? No, why? Because that's not the 2015 section. Says. No, that's the normal age. It's not the mandatory age. It's not the earliest age. It's the normal age for the scheme. And it means that's the age you can access the benefits without them being reduced for early payment. So for 2015, it is state pension age. So 66, 67, 68, depending on who you are. 
For 1995, it is 60 unless you have a special category such as a special class status or MHO. If you have to ask me what either of those things are, then you do not have them. So do not ask me. You know if you have it. Uh, 2008 section is 65. Now, if it means, though, that I want to take my 2015 section at 60 at the same time I take my 1995 benefits, I can absolutely do that. So I'm going to go to the scheme. Hello. I would like that pension at um, 60, please. And I'll go, OK, that's fine. But we thought we were going to pay you a pension of £10,000 a year at 68. Yeah. Want it now. OK, you know it now. But we've got to pay it to you for eight more years now because you want it eight years earlier. Yeah. So we're not going to pay you £10,000 a year anymore. We're going to pay you £7,100 instead because you want it for eight years longer. So what they're doing is they're thinking, I'm going to have an average life expectancy. And so over that time, they would pay out X amount, but I want it over a longer period of time so it gets adjusted. So overall, I receive around about the same entitlement. OK, so what we mustn't do is fixate on the age and I can't take it till I'm 67. What we need to do is be saying, what do I want to do? Can I afford to do it? So I need to know my number. I need to know any other income that I might get, whether it's from another pension or state pension, or whatever it is. And then can I do the things that I want to do? Oh, but Nora, if I take it at 60, it's reduced. Yes, it is. But I don't want it because it's reduced, right? What's reduced? The pension, right? How much is it reduced by? Well, about 29%. OK, but how much was it to start with? Well, I don't know. Right. So what do we do? What do we fixating on? So what we're doing is we're hearing the word reduced and then going, mm, don't want it. But what we're forgetting is it's more to start with than the old sections. It's about a third higher. So it's a third higher. And we might lose a third. Oh, look at that. It's almost the same. So in most cases, actually, your 2015 benefits at 60 will be very similar to what mm. your 1995 benefits would be at 60, for example. It does vary. There are different circumstances that can make it change. In some instances, the 2015 benefits, even taking them at 60, would be higher than what the 1995 benefits would be. So we need to move away from this unconscious bias and prejudice that we have that in 2015 is rubbish because they moved everyone into it. And we need to be really focusing on all of the components. Yes, you're right. It gets reduced if you take it early, 100 percent. Yes, the normal pension age is state pension age, 100 percent. But how much is it built up by and what does that mean? They're, they're all the things that you have to look at. You can't just focus on one component of something that needs multiple components to work out the pension. Does that make sense? So you really have to understand this before we start making decisions. Um, why does the so Spencer, hello. Why does 2015 grow quicker? Is it because of the one and a half percent on top of CPI? Well, it is. So we've got CPI plus one and a half percent plus we've got one fifty fourth compared to one eightieth. So remember your cake, you're cutting your cake into eightieths and you've got another cake the same size next to it and you're going to cook, cut it into fifty four slices. The slices on the fifty four are going to be bigger than the slices on the eightieth. So it's grown more to start with. It's growing at a much rapid, more rapid rate. Um, 2015 has no automatic lump sum. If you pick to take some cash as a lump sum, is this lump sum tax free? Yes, Derek, as we said, all pension lump sums are tax free so long as they do not exceed 268275. If we work beyond age 60, but in 1995, do we lose out? Great question, Sue, comes up a lot. There is a question here, isn't there? The 1995 benefit doesn't have an inflation link when you're in the scheme, it's only linked to your pay. When you get to 60, it's no longer reduced. For taking it because 60 is the normal age so if you don't take it at 60 and your pay isn't really going to change much why would you not take it i can't advise you there might be reasons why not so that's a very sweeping statement but you have to think well once it comes into payment it then it increases each year by inflation so actually potentially sue yes by not taking it there could be pension there that you could be claiming that you're not and it won't get backdated not when you're in service so because it keeps a link to your pay so it's very serious consideration once you get to the normal pension age as to taking the pension now what we're going to talk about shortly is the retirement options 
so partial in return and return and things like that and they're really helpful for being able enabling you to take the pension and continue working so they're options that we should look at hello helen if you retire early but not on your birthday is the percentage reduction adjusted or is it based on your actual age so the percentage reduction is based on your age in years and months so if you want to go at 56 and six months um, compared to 56, it's a different factor. It's slight, it's on a very slight sliding scale based on your age in years and months. There's no kind of cliff edge effect or anything like that. Um, right, I'm coming on to the cloud in a minute. Angie, hold your horses. Um, Lesia, I'm on the 98th. Oh, I think you mean 95. And I'm hoping to take my retirement at 55. I know I get a lump sum payment, but was wondering, do I still get a yearly payment after this? Yes, you can't have one without the other. So in the NHS pension scheme, it's pension and lump sum. You can't separate them. You wouldn't just get a lump sum. It is pension and lump sum. Yes. Would uh, Penny, would it get backdated if you're not in active service? So yes, potentially if you've left the scheme already um, and you've now reached 60. In fact, let's say you've gone past 60, so you're 62, but you're what's called deferred because you've already left the scheme, then it would then get backdated to your normal pension age or the date that you left. Yeah. OK, so you're not in the scheme anymore. So, yes, if you're 62 as an example, sorry, Penny, I don't know how old you are. You don't need to tell me uh, then you could apply to take the pension and it would be backdated to either 60 or when you left, whichever was later. Yeah. But um, the reason it doesn't happen when you're in service is because it still keeps that link to your pay. So if you had a, a, a jump up in a pay band, for example, it would jump the pension up and that's why. OK, any more questions on the scheme benefits themselves before we talk about the cloud? You are welcome. What I will say, Leslie, I'm going to talk to you about process later because this process is really important before we go running headlong into making decisions without having some information. But let's do my cloud. OK, so we're now on slide 29. Um, reactions, who's heard of McLeod? Of course you all have. Marvellous. And do we all understand what it means? Excellent. Rosie, no. Karen, no. Absolutely fine. It's not a test. That's why we're here. OK, let's talk the cloud. I'm going to do it as fast and as succinct as I can. OK, are you sitting comfortably? Get ready and go. OK, so rewind a little bit. Um, it's very important to say at this point that when the 2015 scheme was introduced, it was not just the NHS pension scheme. OK, it was following a wider central government review of all of the public sector pension schemes, and that's sometimes called the Hutton Report. And following that review, all of the public sector pension schemes introduced a new section in 2015, and they all did it in the same way. So civil service, police, fire, teachers, judges, NHS, and so on, all of it. Sorry. So this is not an NHS pensions issue, and that's really important, because again, the scheme get a lot of bad press and it's not actually their fault. Now, when the scheme was introduced on the 1st of April 15, um, again, all of the public sector schemes did the same thing. And what that was, was that not everybody was initially moved across. Um, it depended on two things. Was somebody a member of the pension scheme as at the 1st of April 2012? And if the answer to that was yes, how long did they have to go to their normal pension age? OK. So if you were somebody who had more than 13 and a half years to your normal pension age, you would have automatically been moved into the 2015 section on the 1st of April 15. No choice, mandatory move. Boom, there you go. And if you can access your total reward statement, that is what you will see because your total reward statement is currently only up to date to March 23. If you had between 10 and 13 and a half years to your normal pension age, you would have moved to the 2015 section, but at a later date that was based on your date of birth. So I'm scrolling back because who was that? Somebody said that their uh, total reward statement was only updated to November 2016. And that is because that would have been the date that you moved across to the 2015 section. So you would have fallen into that group. And finally, if you were somebody who had less than 10 years to your normal pension age, you didn't originally move. You stayed in your original section and that was that. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that age was the defining factor in whether somebody did, didn't or even when they did move. Problem. 
Um, so Judge McLeod, now Judge McLeod was a member of the Judicial Pension Scheme. Quite often people think it's named after Judge McLeod, who was the residing judge in the case. Untrue. Judge McLeod raised the legal challenge against the Judicial Pension Scheme. I like to think that if anyone knew what was going on, she did, uh, that the changes were discriminatory on the grounds of age, which of course they were. So long protracted legalness. And then in July 2019, the Court of Appeal found in favour of that position. And again, the Treasury Department in central government are responsible for removing the age discrimination. So again, not NHS pensions, it's right across the board. OK, so this is what happened before very loosely. Uh, most people were in their original section until March 15 and then from the 1st of April 15 you were put into the 2015 section. So in a October last year, October 23, this is how long we've waited, we've gone through lots of consultations and we've had to see lots of iterations, it's very complicated, but from October last year some new regulations came into force implementing the McLeod remedy. So back to your toaster reward statement for those of you that can see it, um, it doesn't reflect what I'm about to tell you and the reason for that is because your statement is produced up to March 23 at the moment and these regulations came into force after that happened. So the next total reward statement that comes this summer should reflect some of these changes but the rest of them don't at the moment, OK, just to be clear. But if you've requested a retirement estimate from your pay or pensions person within your employer or from NHS pensions and you requested that after October, then that will show you some of what I'm about to show you. So it just depends on what you're looking at and when you requested it. So what's going to happen is something called rollback. And this is happening automatically. You do not need to do anything. OK, but what is going to happen is your record is going to be rolled back as if you had carried on in your original section, whether that was 95 or 08, up to the 31st of March 22. And then from the 1st of April 22, everybody has now joined the 2015 scheme. It doesn't matter how old you are or when you did or didn't move the first time. So that's what's happening at the moment. So any estimates that you request or an annual benefit statement will show you this rollback. It will show you in 95, for example, up to March 22. OK, now there's more. In principle, when you then come to take your benefits, you should be given an option. And that option is A and B. So option A is that you're in your 95 or 2008 section up until March 22, and then you're in the 2015 section. And option B is that you're in the 95 or 08 section until March 15, and then you join the 2015 section. So it's about those seven years between 2015 and 2022, and it's the same for everyone who were in the scheme at April 2012, it impacts all of you. So in principle, what should happen is you would get the option A and B and you would go, I'll have B because it's higher. That's how I would envisage that working. The reason you get the choice is because for some people, option A is better and for some people, option B is better. As we've already discussed, they're all pretty similar all round. Um, if anybody has had a review with us before, um, you'll know that some of you have come out with option B has been better and you were all very surprised. Um, and some it's the other way around. There's no kind of right or wrong way, but they are pretty similar overall. Now, if you're retiring imminently, you won't get this choice at the moment just because the pension scheme are not yet geared up to provide both options. So what they'll do is they'll give you option A, which is in your original section to March 22. And your benefits will be paid on that basis. And then retrospectively, you'll then be given option B. So I would presume that you would stick with option A unless option B was higher. And then you would choose option B. I don't think you would choose option B if it was lower. I could be wrong. That's how I would see it working. Now, we need to be patient. Um, NHS pensions have got to revisit all ill health retirements, normal retirements and deaths that have taken place since April 2015 to give them the other option. Uh, in the NHS alone, it is over 300,000 cases and they are currently working through that at the moment. So I know it's not ideal for you guys and you would like to see everything all at once. I totally understand that. It's just not possible. Uh, the pension scheme are working as rapidly as they can. It's a significant undertaking that they've got in addition to trying to deliver contribution rate changes 
partial retirement and the normal service that they provide, plus a new My NHS pension online portal. They've got an awful lot of things they're trying to juggle here. So we just need to try and sit tight as much as we can. OK, um, if I had a pound for every time somebody said, I want my seven years back in 2000 and 1995. Why? Because it's better. Is it? Yes. How do you know? Because it just is. Is it, though? You don't know. The reality is you don't know until you see the figures. So we just need to remember that again and not go in with that kind of unconscious bias that we all seem to tend to adopt. OK, um, right. That was my cloud. Any questions on the cloud coming into questions now? Hello, Spencer. If you leave the NHS before your 1995 normal pension age, what are the pros and cons of claiming it early? I, I'm going to do that later, Spencer, because that's not my cloud related, if that's OK. Do you have to opt out of? Do you have to opt of rollback at retirement? So the rollback happens automatically, Katrina. They're going to do that anyway. And hopefully from your TRS this year, you'll see the rollback. And then the second option, the two options, A and B, you make that decision at retirement as well. And the intention is also that you'll get to see both options on um, your statements from 2025 at some time. Um, Jay, if we opt not to have the rollback, would my pension will pay take into account to calculate the benefits to be the, the one in 2015 or that in 22 or at age 60. So as I've said before, if you're in the 95 or 2008 sections, it's still linked to your current pensionable pay. It doesn't matter when, if uh, you move to 2015, it's linked to your current pensionable pay. OK. Is that option provided when you submit your AW8 form? So your AW8 form, we're going to come on to in a moment, but that's the form that you fill in to say, these are the benefits I want. Here are my bank details. Pay me my money. OK, you need to have seen the figures before you're filling any forms to know what you want to do. So there has to be a process where you request estimates. I'm going to talk to you about the process in a moment. And within those estimates, they should contain both options. Remember, of course, if you request them now, they won't contain both options for the reasons we've just talked about. Uh, Jay, 2015 scheme. List. So the 2015 scheme, as we said, is calculated based on your pensionable pay each year that you're in that scheme for. So if you choose to have your 2015 benefits from 2015, it starts building up from 2015. If you choose to have it from 2022, then it starts building up based on your pay from 2022. It just depends on which option you choose as to how they calculate it, which is why this is really complicated because they need all of your pay history and stuff. It's quite hard. OK, I'm finally beginning to understand what you were talking about. Hallelujah. Um, so you can effectively choose to stay in 2008 for seven more years. Yes, exactly that, Kath. And the only way you can choose really is by looking at the figures and seeing which is the best option for you and your circumstances. And again, it will be different for everyone, depending on service and pay history and age and all that kind of stuff. Sean, so if I retire in February next year, ooh, will I get the option B figures and after that and decide after the event? Right, Sean, I'll be honest with you, a little bit unclear. What NHS pensions are currently saying is that any estimates provided after this summer should have both options included. Now, I'm going with caution with that because the original deadline was April and they didn't meet the April deadline. So um, hopefully if you request an estimate from sort of September onwards, that would have both options. But I really don't know. I've got no control over that. I'm, as, I'm in the dark as you are about that. Um, I'm due to take partial retirement in August. Does that mean I won't get a choice around the cloud? So, Mike, you do actually with partial because with partial, you can choose to take your 95 benefits up to March 15 or up to March 22. But you don't have all of the figures to choose from. I'll come on to that a bit later, but you won't get both options. No. Clouds parting. Hi, Carl. Uh, hello, Leslie Ann. Would the calculations be ready by September? Oh, sorry. See an earlier comment. You probably typed that before I responded. Um, how do you make a decision if we can't see get the figures yet? OK, Angie, let me give you a scenario. Hi, Angie. Uh, I can't give you both options, but I can give you option A. Here you are. Brilliant. I'll take option A because that's all I've got. Let's go. OK, and then later somebody says, right, Angie, here's option B. Now, you're only going to change to option B, I would assume, if it's better than option A. I mean, I think that's how it's going to work. So if option B is better, you'll change to option B and go, oh, a little bit more and it will be a little bit more. Remember what I said before, the figures are very similar. OK, 
If it's worse, I would presume you're going to go, mm, no, sticking with what I've got, thanks. So you can actually make a decision. There's a lot of stressing going on from people going, I don't know. Right, the figures are not hugely different. And um, for me, personally, I would only choose it if it was better. Now, you've got to weigh up your circumstances because what is better for you is not necessarily what's better for someone else. But that's why you get the choice. Um, so you, 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 yeah, exactly, Angie, you retire now and you'll get a retrospective choice. That's exactly it. Um, Malini, I'm coming back to that because that is to do with retire and return, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Katrina, hold your horses because there's a lot of stuff that's got to come with that without just saying yes or no. OK, right. So that's our options. Right now, I've got a whole section in the slide deck you'll have seen on the total reward statement. I am not going to talk to you about the total reward statement on this session. I'm sorry. We haven't got time because of all the retirement stuff. I've put it in the slide deck so that you can read it because we put some red notes next to each of the fields and you can see what they're all telling you. If you go onto our YouTube channel and watch the Understanding Your Benefits webinar we did last month, that does go through uh, the TRS. So you can use that as well, but I'm not going to do it today because it's just not going to have time. Uh, what I will say is you need to check your total reward statement where you can access it through ESR. If you cannot ask for an annual benefit statement, some of you might also have access to my NHS pension online, um, which is a new online system that is being rolled out at the moment, which should replicate the total reward statement and show you service and pay history and things like that. Um, it's been rolled out regionally, so if you haven't got access to it yet, I don't want anybody to tell me, I don't care, um, you will get it, your employer will contact you about it at the time, but again, there's 1.5 million members in the NHS, so you're not all going to get access at the same time, it's just going to be rolled out. But the idea is by the end of this year, everybody should have been offered the opportunity to sign up for that. Okay. Now, the really nice thing about it is also that you, you can amend your email address to a personal one, so you can then still access your statements on a regular basis if you ever come out of the NHS, which you can't obviously do with the total reward statement at the moment. Um, uh, Spencer, you need to take into account 1995 lump sum versus non in 2015. You do, and I have put an example in the slides on that. Um, again, you can swap 2015 pension for lump sum, and even doing that, the 2015 benefits can still come out as higher. Some people, for example, don't want a bigger lump sum, they want a higher regular income, so that works better for them as well. So again, it's all about circumstances and what you need. And it all starts with how much do you need? Because until you know that, you can't make those decisions. Uh, so annual benefit statement by, by employer wages company outsourcing is poor is a way of checking what should be noted as standard. The annual benefit statement is a standard document. They run it through the pension online system. So if you don't like that document, that's the central document that they produce. If you mean the service is poor, then that is a different issue and you might be better off just going direct to the pensions agency. Uh, GP land should be included on the My NHS pension system. I do know Lisa of some GP surgeries that have already got access to it. So again, it will be rolled out. OK, you can always ask your contact to see if they've got any information on it. You can also just try and register, actually. If you go onto the NHS pensions website, you can find on there the registration process and you can try and register just in case they let you. They have been letting some. It's easy again, sorry. Right, so understanding your benefits. Let's talk about lump sum. This has come up a few times already. I want you all to listen really carefully because if I see one more question about when I pay tax on my lump sum, I'm going to delete the Facebook page, OK? Right, the lump sum, there is a limit on the amount of lump sums we can have tax-free, and those limits are set by HMRC. That limit is what we call 25% of your capital value, or £268,275. NHS pensions calculate the maximum lump sum that you can have as a percentage of your capital value. Don't worry about how they do it. It's, it's weird. OK, if you really want to know, we can talk about it another time. But they will tell you on your estimates or on your total reward statement the maximum lump sum you can have. And it's sometimes known as the commutation example. That is the maximum lump sum. You can do anything between the standard and the maximum. It's not one or the other. You can do anything up to the maximum. So they just tell you the maximum and then you can choose a different amount below that if you want to. 
So, so long as your lump sums that you take from your pension are less than £268,275, they are tax free. If you take £100,000 from 1995 and £25,000 from 2015, the total is less than 268275 It is tax free. If you take a lump sum from one and not from the other, it is still tax free. It's tax free, tax free, tax free. Got it? Now, what we have to consider, though, when we do that, because it sounds attractive, doesn't it? Um, oh, look, lump sum is tax free. And we know from earlier that the pension is taxed. Well, yes, but um, when you take a higher lump sum what you're doing is the lump sum goes up the pension comes down okay so you're sacrificing uh, lower regular income for higher lump sum which might be all right but the first thing we need to know is how much regular income do we need so you see we've come full circle back to what we said at the start if i need nine thousand pounds per annum of income but i take the maximum lump sum and it gives me seven thousand pounds of regular income that might not work. I might not be able to meet my financial obligations depending on what I'm doing with the lump sum. And that's what leads us into the next question. So if I want that lump sum to pay off my mortgage, maybe I can live with a lower income. Um, if I want to invest it, maybe I'll get some investment returns and I can live with a lower income. But maybe I can't. And so that is what I need to really assess. If I've got other income, when does that start? So I know my state pension kicks in at state pension age. Maybe I want a higher lump sum so I can do fun stuff, knowing and supplement my income between retirement and state pension age with the lump sum, because then my state pension kicks in. Maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to buy a camper van. Who knows? Maybe what I want to do. Um, how long will I live for? Exactly, Angie. It's a million dollar question when it comes to pensions. OK, now when you get to 60, um, we're going to do life expectancies a bit. Oh, I'll do it now. Let's do it now. Let's go rogue. Right. When you get to your 60s, um, have I got it? There we go. Right. So if you're currently 55, then the expectation is that on average, as a female, you'll live to 88 and a male, you'll live to 86. And if you're 65, for a female, you'll live to 89 and a male, you'll live to 86. So if you take your pension at 55, you're going to be like in, under, under the law of averages. And obviously it's different for everyone and stuff. But under the law of averages, you're going to receive your pension for 30 years. Now, remember, your annual pension increases each year by inflation. So it's going to go up a lot in that time. What are you going to do with the lump sum? What happens when you die? So um, there are only spouse or partner pensions payable in the event of your death or um, to children who are under the age of 23 or un unable to work due to physical or mental disability. So where you've got older children, there's no pension payable. And if you've not got a spouse or partner, that can be quite important. So sometimes people want to take a higher lump sum so they can put it into trust in the event of their death and things like that. Uh, what do you think inflation is going to look like? I mean, who knows? So these are all things that you have to consider when looking at, at what you're going to do in terms of taking your option. Um, so the thing I'm going to come to the question in a second. I just got to do one more thing on lump sums. The way that we swap pension for lump sum is using a factor of 12 to 1. OK, so what that means is that for every 12 pounds of lump sum I take, I will lose one pound per annum off my pension. Doesn't sound a lot, does it? But what that's really saying, if we ignore tax for a second and increases, if I live for more than 12 years, I would have had more money by taking the higher pension and the lower lump sum. Now, it's not quite that clear, is it? Because we know the pension goes up by inflation, but might be subject to tax. Lump sum is tax free. Again, what are we doing with the lump sum? Are we paying for the mortgage and so on? But it's something you really need to consider. Is it about how you plan your spending? So you want more now to have fun? Or do you take more value from a higher regular income? And it's very unique. It just depends on your circumstances. So I've not got the answers for you. But what I am saying is you need to give it a lot of thought before you start jumping and making decisions, which might not give you the best financial outcome for you. It's really important. Questions? Um, 
Melini, why is the basic final pay on my TRS different to what is my actual basic salary? Because the final pensionable pay on your TRS is your pensionable pay that you've received in the last 12 months. So from the 1st of April 22 to the 31st of March 23. Also, it is pensionable pay. It is not necessarily. Um, you might have different pensionable elements in your pay as well. I, so you need to check. I can't tell you. But look at the dates. If the date is to March 23 and you're looking at your March 24 pay slip, it's going to be different, isn't it? So you need to have a look. Um, Spencer, can you use your 1995 lump sum for your other NHS pensions? Aha, no, but maybe yes, in a way. So because your lump sum is tax free, when you pay contributions into a pension, that is also tax free. And therefore, if you use your lump sum to put it into a pension, you would get double tax relief. And HMRC don't really like that for some reason. And that's called recycling rules and you're not really allowed to do it. However, what you could do is um, take your lump sum pay extra into your NHS pension from your salary and then use your lump sum as extra income for living off because you put more salary into the pension. That is semantics. It gives you the same result, but you could do that, yes. You can't just put the lump sum in though. They're bad. Uh, Karen, feeling a bit thick? No, Karen. So it says pension 4144 and then lump sum 27K and then adult pension pension is 2578. Is the 2578 the pension that I would get if I take the lump sum? No. If your pension is 4144, that's what you get. Plus, because you're in the 95 scheme. Oh, hang on. So there's a maximum lump sum, I suspect, of 27K. So if that says lump sum 27K, that would be the maximum, I think. And then a pension of 4144. The 2578 is the pension that would be payable to your partner or spouse in the event of your death as an annual pension amount. That's what adult dependent pension is. Again, if you want to go back and look at the notes um, after the session at the back, that tells you what those things are. Um, and that's what it is. And also in our notes on the slides, mm -hmm. um, we've got adult dependent pension. See here, this is the pension payable on your death to your spouse or partner. OK, that's what that is. Different thing. Um, Christina, thank you. This is excellent. I have learned so much, but I'm going to have to go and catch up on YouTube. Oh, bye, Christina. Bye. Uh, Paul, if you were to invest to get the same regular income, what kind of return would you typically need to obtain? Of course, investment scope would have. Well, work it out, Paul, on a 12 to 1 factor. So you probably need 6% um, return at least, something like that. And you would pay potentially tax on your investment return, depending on how much it was. So you just um, you, you would need uh, probably some really savvy investment knowledge or financial advice to help you with that. Who is the best person to ask which option is better for me? Uh, right, Mona. So do you want to know which option is better for you? So do you want somebody to tell you what to do or do you want somebody to give you all of the information that says, right, Mona, if you do this, it means this. If you want to retire at this age, it means that. This is how much lump sum you can have and this is what that means. And then you make the decision because those are two different things. The second one is guidance and information and education. The first one is advice. They are different things and they have different cost support against them. Nobody within your employer or NHS pensions can give you advice. They might be able to give you some guidance. They'll be able to give you some information. But if you want a lot of tailored information, it's different. So that's just what you've got to try and work out. We do do this. We provide tailored support where we would do a report that said, right, if you want to retire at 56, this is option A, this is option B on the McLeod. These are your some options. Um, this is what this means, this is what that means. Um, it just depends on what you need, really. Right, let's talk about flexible retirement, which we have had some questions on already. So flexible retirement, uh, people get very confused with the terms. Um, so just to so we be clear, flexible retirement is the ability to um, sort of segue into retirement slowly, if you like. So it might be that we carry on working in some form and we access some or all of our pension. Um, so it's a collective term for a number of different options. The two main options that we've got in the NHS pension scheme are partial retirement, sometimes referred to as drawdown, um, and retire and rejoin slash return. They are two different things. Um, but what they both allow you to do is to take your pension benefits and continue earning in your NHS role. But they work in different ways. So I'm going to talk to you about partial first and then we'll pause 
and then we'll talk about retire and rejoin. So just wait, because sometimes we get questions about one when we're talking about the other, and it's important we don't muddy the waters, OK? So partial retirement has always been an option for 2008 and 2015 members, but it didn't used to be an option for 1995. It has become an option for everybody, including 95 members, from October last year. And what partial retirement is, is it's the ability where you can take some or all of your pension benefits. You continue in your NHS role as continuous employment. There is no break in service. So you keep your terms and conditions, annual leave and so on, and your employment rights. And you can also continue to build up further benefits in your 2015 section. OK, so you can take some or all of the pension, you continue at work and you can continue building up more 2015 benefits. So the question we had earlier about can I take my 95 benefits at 60 and carry on working? This is how you do that. This is one of the ways you do that. When we say all or some of the pension, it's got to be a minimum of 20% and up to a maximum of 100% of your benefits at any one time. OK, now there are a couple of rules we need to be aware of. The main one is a stickler for in lots of occasions. The first rule, the main thing really, is that in order to do a partial retirement, you have to reduce your pensionable pay from the last 12 months by at least 10% for the next 12 months only. Um, and you have to do that through a change in your terms and conditions. So it's a contract variation. Um, so one example could be that I work 37 and a half hours a week. I'm going to drop 10 percent of my hours, which would be 3.75. And that would achieve the reduction in pensionable pay. You can reduce by more than 10 percent. It's got to be at least. OK, so the common one is hours. Sometimes we see people having extra unpaid leave. Sometimes we see people um, reducing their band. Sometimes we have employers that will effectively do what we call a payroll adjustment. So what that means is, for example, if you earn a thousand pounds a month, you continue to earn a thousand pounds a month and work your hours. But for the first year, only 900 pounds of that is pensionable because the pensionable pay has then gone down by 10%. Not all employers are adopting this approach. I don't know why. There's a whole set of guidance about how to do it. Um, so you really do need to find out from your employer what they are prepared to support. Now, a lot of this with employers, I think, is education. Again, when I'm saying employer, you might speak to your manager and your manager might not know anything about it. Your manager doesn't write the HR policies and is not a pensions person. So they might not be the right person to speak to. You might need to speak to somebody else. If you are looking at a partial, particularly if you want to reduce your hours, that is a flexible working request. Everybody has a right to request flexible working, but you do not have a right to be given it. So just because you want to reduce your hours for partial retirement doesn't mean that you are able to do that. But your employer must consider it properly through the flexible working policy. So what you will need to do is get your retirement policy and your flexible working policy so you can understand what your options are. Um, right. Question on partial. Um, can you pay more from your salary into your pension? Um, doesn't two, 2015 go off pensionable pay? Yeah, so you, you what you do, the 2015 scheme builds up based on your pensionable pay, but paying more into your pension doesn't reduce your pensionable pay. It just increases your pension contribution, Carolyn. So you can pay extra to buy yourself additional 2015 pension and your pensionable pay remains the same. It doesn't change. Um, Susan says why, I don't know what Susan's saying, why too, sorry. Susan, can you remind me? Um, can you earn any amount if you take all your entire NHS pension and leave work and or work outside the NHS? Yep. So this this uh, partial retirement and retire and return are all about the ability to take your pension and continue earning a pay through NHS employment. If you leave the NHS and go and work somewhere else, nobody cares. The only thing to remember is income tax because you'll have two sources of income and the HMRC will assess that for income tax. But there are no restrictions, no. So you can do what you want. 
Um, this has only come into Northern Ireland from April. You're right, it has, Claire. So I said October very confidently, but actually Northern Ireland were lagging a few months behind. Um, and they are quoting six to nine months for payout of 95 benefits and continue work in 2015. To be honest, Claire, Scotland is also on over six months at the moment and um, England is running into five months. They are all under the cosh for all the reasons we talked about before. The cloud, contribution rate changes, factor rate changes, partial retirement and so on. So, yes, there is quite a long lead in time, which I'm going to come on to as well for all of these. Um, the guidance notes on AWA section 7 states to give a 24 hour break. Is this only the case for retire and return? Yes, Karen. And if you are on the Facebook group and you search, you'll see that um, what we say is if you are doing a partial retirement, you cross out section 7 on the AWA because it is not required. Uh, Jill, how does this work with the agenda for change reduction to 36 hours over the next three years? Shouldn't impact um because it's uh you've got no control over that so similarly if you have a pay award or you go up a band that is outside of your control so it doesn't impact you can carry on as you were so it shouldn't make any difference Jane, can you buy the equivalent of full-time hours in 2015 if you work 30 hours? No, you can pay additional contributions to buy extra pension to increase your 2015 pension if you want. We do have a boosting benefits webinar that covers that. Um, how long does one need to live if you take the pension at 55 to make it better off than leaving it at 60? Ah, Anand, I get this question a lot. So what Anand's saying there is if he takes the pension at 55, it's reduced compared to if he took it at 60, but he's going to receive it for five years longer. So at what point do they kind of cross over and you say you would have had the same amount? It's usually uh, early to mid 80s, Anand. It's not exact for everyone, usually around 80 to 83. So what that means is if you took the 95 benefits at 60 compared to at 55, by the time you got to 82, 60 becomes more valuable if you live beyond 82-ish, somewhere around there. Might be 84, it just depends. Um, OK, uh, retire and return uh, or retire and rejoin as it now is. You probably are all a bit more familiar with this one. It's been around for a while. This is where essentially you have to resign, leave your NHS employment, have a gap of at least 24 hours. Now, some trusts will insist on longer. It is a local trust decision. Could be up to two weeks. Um, you then return to work either in a new role or the same role, but on a new contract of employment. And that might also mean a change to your terms and conditions, such as your annual leave and your sick pay. Again, it's a local decision. Also could affect where you are in your pay band. So you need to make sure you check all of that through the retirement policy before making any decisions. Also ignore what a lot of people say on the Facebook group because every trust works differently and you need to make sure you know what your employer is doing. However, you can now continue to build up benefits in the 2015 scheme and that came in a few months ago as well. So you must make sure that you have a break. That's the thing, and it's got to be at least 24 hours, but it can depend on the employer. There is no requirement, though, to reduce your pensionable pay, uh, so you could, in theory, earn more money if you want with a retire and return. Uh, somebody asked me earlier about awards, so if you've got an ACCEA award, um, the rules have also changed against that. It used to be if you did retire and return, you lost that. Usually you would be expected to keep it now, but just double check again before making any decisions. Sometimes it's on a case by case basis, so you're better off asking the association just before you make any decisions that it's OK for you to keep it. OK. Uh, bye, Jess. Um, what is step down and wind down? So step down or wind down are, can be similar things. They are just perhaps where you're looking at slowing down but not accessing the pension. So you might um, like take a lower banded role or you might work less hours, but you don't need to access the pension yet. So you're just basically graduating yourself into retirement. May I double check, only complete section seven if fully retiring? No, section seven is if you do a retire and return because it is asking if you're coming back to work. So if you're fully retiring, you're not coming back to work. Partial retirement, you're not coming back to work because you never left work because it's continuous. OK. 
Jay, back to the lump sum and tax issue. Can we pay into a private pension after retirement from 95 to reduce tax? This would make sense if I stayed employed and a salary away at all this cover. No, you should be OK, so long as you pay into it from your tax income. So don't take your lump sum out of 95 and hoi it into a SIP, because that's going to give you the recycling issue again. But if you take the lump sum and use your salary or even your pension income and pay into a SIP, because that's taxable earnings, the pension income, that is fine. It's just the lump sum you've got to be careful with. Um, I'm in the 95 section and 2015 scheme. It seems I'm losing out by not retiring from 95 section of Connolly 60. Oh, Louise, absolutely. So um, you were still building up benefits in 95 until 2022. And obviously partial and that only came in last year. But definitely have a look at taking that now as soon as you can. Um, you could pick tomorrow as your retirement date and they would backdate it. So just have a think about that. Definitely look at that. Paula, I was advised to leave the NHS pension scheme by a company for a couple of years and pay into a private pension, I'm sure. Uh, rejoining the NHS and stop the private pension and has since received compensation. Is it worth paying any of that into my NHS pension to buy back some of the benefits I lost out on? Possibly, um, but you'd have to again do it through an additional pension uh, arrangement or something like that. So you'd have to look into that. It might be worth doing the boosting benefits webinar as well. Bye. Everybody's leaving. I'm sad. Uh, OK, very quickly then. So they are the retirement options. I want to show you um, the process very quickly. So you need to make sure you get all of your information together. OK, uh, this is really important. So remember what I said before, walk, don't run. 12 months minimum lead in time. There's no rush to this. This is the rest of your life. This is the next 35 years. This is your 35 year holiday. We're not running out the door before we know what we're doing. So you need to get all of your information. So you get estimates. You can request an estimate from NHS pensions or your employer if they do them uh, 12 months before your intended retirement date. They are currently taking 40 days and if you're in Scotland, even longer. So you need to be doing this as early as you can. When you get your estimate, you need to make sure that you understand your options, cash options, what that does to pension income, etc. Work out how much money do you need, all that kind of stuff. Then you need to have a discussion with your employer. Do you want to reduce your hours? Do you want a payroll adjustment? Are you doing retire and return? Will they let you come back? Not everybody's letting everybody do a retire and return at the moment. Recruitment issues, blah, blah, blah. So you need to have those conversations and you need to be prepared to negotiate. And that could last a few weeks. You can't ask on Monday and expect them to tell you on Wednesday if it's all right. So a reasonable time frame in the uh, staff council is four weeks minimum and then you might have to go backwards and forwards so if it takes 40 days to get an estimate and then you've got to understand it and then you've got to negotiate for six weeks we are getting on aren't we we are moving on for time because when you complete your awa or retirement form if you are in scotland um that they need the pension scheme needs about four to five months notice currently some of them are taking six months to pay the pension benefits to you so by before you know it 12 months has gone we cannot rush this if we've got time we need to give ourselves time okay i expect all of you to be looking at this stuff when we leave even if you're not retiring for five years check your service check your data uh, understand it read the notes go through it again go through it again look at the facebook resources look at the websites because you need to build up that picture then what happens is you fill your forms in and assuming there's no issues with the forms they will make payment right this is really important it catches people out a lot the requirement is to pay your benefits within 30 days of your retirement date so if your retirement date is the 31st of march they will aim to pay you on the 30th of april you will not get a payment on the 31st of March. It's very unlikely. You need to budget for that. In some cases, it takes longer. It could be two or three months. You need to have a contingency in place to be able to manage this, even if it's an overdraft with the bank, because the bank know the money is coming. I know it's not very comfortable. That is the reality of what we're dealing with. So you're going to have to plan for that. Pensions are always paid monthly in arrears anyway, um, similar to what your pay is. So again, you need to just make sure your timing is right. It is really, really important. Do you want me to do questions or shall we do the uh, forms? Let's do forms and I'll do questions. It means you have to wait. Right, this is the AW8 form. Sorry for those of you who are not English, maybe get another drink. Right, this is the AW8 form. Everybody says to me, I can't fill the form in. It's really hard. It's quite hard, but I think the thing about the form is it looks big. So it makes you go, mm, um, uh, let's break it down. Sections one to five, your employer fills in. So ignore. You do not need to concern yourself too much with sections one to five. You fill in from section six onwards. Section six is your basic information, name, date of birth. Pretty sure you can do that. Section seven, as we've discussed, we don't need to fill that in for a partial. 
uh, or a complete retirement, we do retire and return. It's just about when you're coming back. Section eight, do you want to allocate some of your pension? That basically means do you want to take some of your pension now and leave it to someone when you die so you don't get it now? Most people say no, but there are notes you can look at it. Section nine is about how do you want to take your benefits? This is section nine. OK, now it says here, which section or scheme are you claiming your benefits? So if I've got 95 and I'm claiming 95, I tick and then it says go to 9.2. If I've got 2015 as well, but I'm not claiming it yet, I don't tick that because I'm not claiming it yet. But if I am claiming it, then I tick that as well. And it says go to 9.4. I don't tick 2008 because I'm not in it. OK, so you just got to think about what are you in and what benefits are you taking? And this is why you need to have done all of your due diligence before you fill the forms in. Sometimes people say to me, I'm filling the forms in and I don't know what to put about lump sum. Well, that's because you haven't decided and you shouldn't be filling the forms in until you've decided what you want to do. Step away from the forms. No. If you are doing a partial retirement England, then you will need also to fill in the supplementary form. OK, this is what the supplementary form looks like. It is version five. Some employers are still trying to give you version one. Do not accept version one. Look for version five. You can also get it on the website that we looked at earlier. Again, sections one to three, your employer fills in. So don't worry about payroll information. It does say very clearly on the form to be completed by the employer. So not you, employer. OK, you can't do it. You fill in these tiny little bits here. OK, and what they're asking is how much of your benefits do you want? So if you want all of your 1995 section up to 2022, you want box B, you tick 95. If you want 2015 as well, you tick 2015. If you want 50 percent of your 95, you put the percentage in box C. Or if you only want 1995 up to March 15, which was a question somebody asked me earlier, you can choose just to have the bit up to March 15. But in payment at this stage, then you would tick box A and they're all labelled and you only fill in one of them. Somebody filled in all of them and then wondered why it was rejected and it then took another 30 days to process their retirement and it's because it was wrong. Something else as well with the AWA, you've got to sign it and date it and the next page a witness has to sign it and date it. Please make sure that your witness has dated it the same date that you have, even if they perhaps didn't, because if they didn't date it the same date, they can't have witnessed it, can they? And they will send the form back. You need to make sure that you're on top of the forms because as soon as there's a problem, they will send them back and then they will wait till you send it back and then it will be at least another 30 days before it gets processed again. So it all is delaying the, you being able to access your money, these errors. OK, so really important. We are looking at doing separate webinars specifically about forms because we can't do it all on the session today. But you do need to make sure that you fill it in properly and sign it and date it. OK, and then your forms go back through payroll or your pensions person. So somebody said to me the other day they sent their forms in directly and they retired in January, still haven't had their payments. And I said, did it not go back through the employer? And they said, no, employer didn't really seem to know what they were doing. And I'm like, yeah, but has to go back through the employer because the employer has stuff they have to fill in and the employer has to update things on ESR and my pension online. So the reason it's not being paid is because that hasn't happened because your employer doesn't know you're retiring. So you need to involve everybody at the process. Don't try and cut corners. We've got some FAQs in the slides as well there, but you can have a look at those later on on your own. Um, right, I'm going to stop. There's a lot that you can think about. So we've covered how much do you need? First thing, where what will you get from the state and all the things? Where, what will you get from the NHS pension scheme? When should you retire? Think about the process. It's really important. Right, there are some links here in these images to where you can get other help. That takes you to the NHS pensions website that we looked at, the Entitled to Calculator and so on. This is me. Take a photograph of my email address. If you haven't got the slides, email me and I will send them to you separately. Please don't call me because I'm always doing webinars and will never answer the phone ever. OK, right. Questions. Um, right. OK, you all got excited, didn't you? Uh, right. Um, can I totally retire and only take the 95 benefits and freeze by 2015 without adding additional contributions and take this at normal pension? Age? Absolutely, Michelle. World is your oyster. You can do different things with both of them, whatever you want. This is the best evening ever. Thanks, Sarah. I was 60 on Sunday. I'm all over. Get on it. Get straight on that. Well done. And happy birthday. Um, Alison, if you have special class status in 95, is it worth taking the pension between 55 and 60? Alison, if you have special class status, then you can take the pension from 55 without it being reduced for early payment. So the only reason you perhaps wouldn't take it at 55 is one, because you didn't know, in which case get on it, or two, because you're expecting a humongous pay increase. 
um, because it's not going up anymore, remember, apart from pay. And when it's in payment, it's by inflation. So again, special class status, get on it, have a look at it. Uh, waiting for my quote ready for February 25. Well done, Diane. Excellent work. Uh, Paulette, you're amazing. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. I'm going to do some more tea in a minute. No, everyone's all right. Will we get a copy of the slides? Right. So the slides should have been sent out before the session, Louise. They would have been sent to the email address that you booked on with. They may have gone in a junk, so check that. But if you still haven't got them, send me an email to the email address you can see on the screen and I will send them to you probably tomorrow, not tonight. I hope that's OK. Uh, Amanda, 54 and reduced banding a year ago. Our best to retire at 55 so the pension can be based on the higher wage. Amanda, did you reduce your banding with the same employer? If you did, you can apply for something called pay protection. So Google NHS pensions pay protection. Um, and what that means is that you can protect your 1995 benefits at your previous level of pay with an inflation link. So definitely have a look at that. You usually have to do it within 12 months. There might be a bit of leeway on that, but definitely look into that because it is worth doing. Um, can we ask for a variety of options? Is there a limit? Oh, right. So you can ask for one estimate in a 12 month period. So no, Sue, if you want to say, well, what would 56 be if I did this? And what would 56 be if I did that? And what would 56 in three months be? You can't do that. One estimate in 12 months is all they are entitled to provide. So if you want more at the moment, in the absence of any functioning modelers, you might need to look at paying for extra support to help you with this. Sorry. Alison, have just applied for 95 deferred pension from end of August this year at 60. Should I check with pensions to form it? Yes. So that's one thing I should have said. Thank you, Alison. That was an excellent prompt. When your forms have got in, because Alison's deferred, it, it should be an AW8P and it should go straight into pensions. Ring them to check it's been received. Ring them every now and then and ask them for an update. If you're an active member, as I said, it's got to go through your employer, right? Don't assume once it's been sent to your employer, they've been super whipsnappy and sent it off straight away because they probably haven't. You need to check with your employer every couple of weeks that it has been sent to the pensions agency. And when they confirm it has, ring the pensions agency and check with the pensions agency. They have everything they need, right? So you do need to be proactive in this as well. You can't just leave it the chance. I know you would like to. Maybe there's an argument to say that we should be able to, but let's assume that we know that we can't and we need to be on it, OK? Proactive. Partial retirement should not incomplete employment details section seven. No, Annie, I've said it four times now. I will say it again. We do not complete section seven for a partial retirement. Will boosting benefit sessions be advertised? Laura, all of our webinars are on our website under the webinars section and boosting benefits is on there. I believe we do two of those a year. I mean, I do them. I should know. There is also a pre-recorded version you can find on our YouTube channel. If you just go onto YouTube and search pay engage, we should come up and there is one on there as well. Uh, can we book appointments with Pengage now? I noticed you were very busy. Right, Eleanor, you can and we will help you. Um, there is a contact form on our website that you can fill in. Uh, it will send you some information back automatically with an idea of cost, depending on the information that you have put in. It will also send you a list of stuff that we need if you want some modelling doing. Modelling is estimates and forecasting. It's just another word for it. So if you tick yes, you'll get a list. I need you to get all of the information on that list and then confirm and then we can set you up on our portal if you want to go ahead. It's a big list. Right. Um, because as you now know, we need lots of pay history. We need to know what's happened with your service. We need to check your added years. We need all of those things. So it's a big list and you need to be prepared that you might have to go off and do some work to get that information if you haven't got it already. But if you're not prepared to do that, maybe we might not want to work with you because actually what you're saying is that you probably don't really want to know and, and you, you need all this information to know. So it's a big list. I know I'm aware, but we're only asking for what we absolutely need for. I don't want information for fun. Uh, will pension be backdated to the dates you specify if pension is strongly to process your request? Yes, Angie. So let's say your, your pension date is the 1st of June and that's what it says on your forms. If they don't pay it until August, it will be backdated to June. Absolutely. You'll just be without some of that income in that time. Karen, I attended a bank webinar and it was nowhere near as informative as this. Thank you very much. You are more than welcome. Um, is the estimate the same as your TRS? No, Barbara. It is not. Your TRS is a snapshot. Go back and have a look at the TRS slides. The TRS is a snapshot showing you the benefits that you've built up up to the end of March. It also doesn't include McLeod rollback. It won't include um, any early retirement factors for taking early and so on. So do not make decisions based on the TRS. Get yourself a pension estimate. Hello, Jay. Sorry for being sick. Not Jay. What is the key difference between partial retirement and retirement return? Seems you can take full pension benefits, remain in employment and continue to pay the 2015 scheme in both. Yes, you can. Right. Very quickly, Jay. Partial retirement, continuous service, 
remain on existing terms and conditions, keep employment rights, have to reduce pensionable pay by 10%. But as we said, there are different ways of doing that. Retire and return, you resign, you have a break in service and you come back. You might have to come back on different terms and conditions, different annual leave entitlement. Sometimes you can't do retire and return. Sometimes employers will only have you back retire and return for a year and then say you can't do it anymore. Whereas partial is continuous. In my personal opinion, partial is always better for the employee if you can do that because it protects your employment rights because you're not leaving and coming back. But you need to check your retirement policy within your employer to see. Some retire and return is absolutely fine because some employers honour everything as it was. But you need to check that. Uh, is the lump sum also paid up to three months after you actually leave? Potentially. Um, the idea is it's 30 days after your retirement date or that you've, they've got everything that you need. Um, but if your forms aren't sent in with enough notice, then it could be two or three months later. So potentially, yes. So forms need to be on time. They need to be right. Um, and at least then it will be 30 days after your retirement date. Uh, Laura, sorry to get you to say it again, but just to confirm, if I reduce an hour's now at 58, but say on the same band, it won't affect my 95 pension. Correct. 100% full time pay. And that's because you've already built up your service in 95. You're not adding any more to it. It just remains linked to pay. It will affect 2015 going forwards because obviously your pay will be less. Thank you. You're welcome, Michelle. If I'm not in employment, do I still complete the AWA? You do an AWA P, Susan, assuming you're in England. Um, just Google it. Um, AW8 sections one to five is deferred member who fills that out. No, deferred member AW8P, Spencer. So no, you can't do that one if you're in serve uh, if you're not in service. Uh, employers told me, told me to send direct AW8P. No, right, let me do this again. Lots of AW8P. An AW8P is what you complete if you are not an actively in that section of the scheme anymore, OK? Because AW8P stands for preserved. So preserved means your benefits have already been calculated because you already left, OK? Your employer is not involved in that part of the process, which is why you don't use the normal AW8 form, because we don't give a monkeys about what the employer has to say, because they've already told NHS pensions that you left whenever it was that you left. So you fill in an AW8P for the deferred and it goes straight to NHS pensions. If you are an active contributing member to your section currently, it is an AW8 and it has to go by your employer so that they can close you down on the system because you're still active on the system. OK. Welcome. Um, if my normal pension age is 55 in 95, should I take this at 55? I'm considering partial retirement next year. Best no. Right, Fiona, I'll say it again. This question is, comes up all the time and I need you all to listen really carefully. Once you reach your normal pension age in the 1995 section, whether that is 55 or 60, nothing else happens to the pension unless your pay goes up. So, if your pay is just going to go up by standard pay awards, you're missing out on pension that you could be claiming because once your pension is in payment, it is linked to inflation. If, however, you're expecting a regressive pay increase, it might be worth waiting, but even then it might not be. You would have to do the analysis. You have to look at this and understand your options. But if your pay is pretty much tapped out now, then the potentially yeah, you're going to miss out on pension benefits you could be claiming. OK? Five years of pension benefits is a lot of money. So you need to think about that really carefully. If I take my 95 pension, I'm working 23 hours a week. Do I still have to reduce my pension or pay? Yes, Sarah, the requirement is to do a partial retirement. Anyone, whoever you are, whatever hours you work, however much you earn, you have to reduce pensionable pay by 10%. Uh, a separate great uh, webinar will be great before it's on the list, Karen. Um, if deferred, yes, you send direct. Very happy. More than welcome, everyone. When is the webinar on forms, please? I haven't done it yet, Annie. Literally spoke to the team about it today. I'll be honest, there might be a small charge for that one. Um, the only reason being that we actually do provide support for forms separately, which is chargeable. What we're looking at doing is doing a webinar that's specifically on forms with a small cost that's lower than the chargeable service for filling the forms in if that makes sense to try and help more people but i don't know yet we're still working on it if you have special class status should this show on your annual benefit statement sometimes it does penny sometimes it doesn't not very helpful so if it doesn't i would check i would just your employer knows so ask your employer to check your special class status you are more than welcome everyone lovely um yes get on the case linda i'm rooting for you uh, more than welcome, more than welcome. Sorry, I'm just skimming. Um, 
Yes, yeah, Stephen, get on with it. You can still put the date of August, you know, even if they don't pay it until October for, for the notice and it'll be backdated. Just, you know, that helps. Um, can I confirm that deferred benefits? Yes, no, yes, it does. I've done that. Retiring next year at 66. Will I still get the full amount of my 95? Right, Joan, because you're past the normal pension age, you need to be getting onto that 95 as soon as you can. You will still get the full amount, but you could have claimed it from 60, so you need to get onto that straight away, and they're not going to backdate it. So move as fast as you can on that. Um, got special class, going to get pensions estimates. You're more than welcome. Welcome. Yes, homework like that. Uh, you're more than welcome. Cost for pensions advice. So we don't give advice, Malini. We are guidance and education. So we will do pensions modelling and forecasting and put it in a swanky report for you. And we'll talk you through the report and tell you what your options are and your lump sum options and what it will mean and how much this will be and how much that will be. But we don't tell you what to do because that would be advice. So if you want advice, then you need to see a financial advisor. Um, the cost will vary um, depending on your circumstances. They start from 450, but it could be more depending on what you want to know. So um, if you fill in the contact form that's on our website at the bottom, uh, that'll give you an idea. Um, if I take my pension, 95 pension, I'm working 24 hours. Yeah, I've, I've done that already, Sarah. Um, thank you for your patience. I'm waiting for an estimate. Uh, you're more than welcome, Christine. Um, I'm sorry for all the mum voices and the lecturing. Sometimes I feel it necessary. Still haven't dropped my tea either, so half it's out here. Uh, Chris, if I was to go from 37 hours to 30, I would be reducing pension pay by 20%. Would I be better waiting off till I'm 60 as I would have to reduce 10% of it? So that is the thing, Chris, you can reduce now, but then when you then come to we'll take the benefits and do a partial retirement, your 10% reduction has to be effective from your retirement date. So you'd have to do a further reduction uh, at that point, not by the full amount necessarily, but you still have to do another change. So you probably just want to work out what's best for you there. My London waiting is due to drop as working at another site, which is out of London waiting. My pay band will remain the same. Should I apply for pay protection? I don't think you can, Joanna, in that circumstance, but have a look. Um, how much would be considered a significant increase? Increment within band A, should I defer until then? How long would we be deferring for, Anne? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? Because you've got to receive it for a full 12 months before you get the full impact of it. So um, if it's, you know, two months in and then wait 12 months, it might be. But if it's a year in and then you've got to wait another year, it might not be. So that's what you've got to try and work out. You've got the formulas, though, at the start of the slide. You can work it out yourself if you know the pay. Um, you are very welcome, everyone. Um, what date should I put before if I want to receive my pension if I take it at 60? The day it hits 60 or the day after. So your retirement date is your 60th birthday and then your pension date will be the day after. OK, so your retirement date is the last day you work. So that would normally be 60. To be honest, it's not really going to make any difference to the figures one day, is it? Um, Julie, uh, I'm in 95, left after 30 years, then returned and paid into 2015 for the last four years, so seven years out. So claiming deferred, that makes sense. Can I for send the form straight back to pension? Yes. So it's an AW8P because you had a gap of more than five years. So it's an AW8P and that goes straight back to pension. Um, you would just tick an age retirement for 60 and you don't need to put a date on it because they'll know that an age retirement is your 60th birthday and you can carry on as you are without a break because it's deferred. Yes. Um, yes, catch up on YouTube. Don't have care forecast on my SPP, but my colleague does. Both of us are in 9 to 5 in 2015. That is interesting, Graham. You have to give them a, a ring or something and see what they say. I don't really know why that would be. Um, sorry, can you claim 95, 2015 and do retire and return? Yes, you can, Julie, and you don't have to still contribute to 2015 if you don't want to. I would seriously consider that, though, because you get all the death and service cover and ill health cover still if you do, as well as, of course, more pension, but you don't have to, no. Um, so, Karen, is it on the NHS website you are contact for a forecast? So I don't know if you hear in the beginning, Karen, we did a quick demo of the NHS pensions website. There is a section that says how to request an estimate. You have to scroll down a bit uh, and there's a link for a form if you want to get it from the NHS pensions agency or you can ask your pensions person within your employer if you've got one and they might be able to do it for you directly. And if they can, it's quicker. So that's something to look into. Right. Um, and 18 months. Don't know, Anne, I think that's going to be a close call, actually. When you weigh up that you could have been receiving the pension for that many more months against how much it's going to change the pension i, I feel like I don't, i'd have to i'd have to do a proper bit of analysis on it but i feel like that might be tight decision 
If you leave the NHS, you can still take your pension at any time rather than wait till pension age. Uh, yes, you can usually, um, but it would be reduced, of course, if you took it early. So just remember that. Excuse me. Right. I have finished. You are more than welcome, everyone. I hope you're all all right and nobody has slipped into a coma whilst we were doing that. Um, it is quite rapid. As I said, there is more on the slides than what we've talked about so that you can go away and have a look at that. Do use the Facebook group. Do use the search functions. They are really helpful. Do use the websites as well. But of course, we are here to answer any questions. Any new webinars you can find on our website, which is pengage.co.uk forward slash webinars. I'll say that again. Shall I just put in the chat? That might be a bit easier, on it? Um, there is not one on there about forms at the moment because uh, we haven't decided when we're doing them, but we're going to try and do one every month or six weeks, I think. So keep an eye out for that. And I will obviously put it on the Facebook group when we have decided what we're doing. So keep checking back because more webinars do pop on as well as we go through. OK. Wonderful. All right. If everybody's happy there, I'm going to leave you there and go and have my tea. Um, Yes, the, the YouTube, Pauline, the YouTube link will go on the Facebook group as well. Um, it might be tomorrow. If I'm feeling really efficient, it might be tomorrow. Probably Thursday, if I'm honest, but um, it will appear at some point if you can just bear with me. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, so much. You have been really great. Love all of the questions. That is brilliant. And I hope you have a really nice evening. Thank you.